questions that could be relayed? Anyone using Java? Ludwig, you're late. Uh, can you do Java? Oh my God, okay. So it depends on the content you just then leave. <laughs> Uh, Chava, nobody Chava, please. Thank you. Okay. Good. Uh, so let's get started. I think we are pretty much on time. So thanks for joining. As you can see this time, uh, Derek isn't here. He's uh, at the NIST workshop on lightweight cryptography. So he can't do uh, the two events at the same time. So I will run the show. Uh, you know the note well. This is what we distributed for the agenda. Uh, one slight change that you will notice down there is um, initially we had uh, William not on the agenda, then I added him for token revocation. And today I swapped him out for a different topic where he submitted the document. Uh, um, and I thought that would be a good introduction, a topic that we had been uh, dealing with for, for quite a while and native apps is obviously are super important for, for the smartphone development. Um, so on the agenda we have, uh, starting with the most important items that uh, working group items that we want to finish, uh, token exchange, then the proof of possession and the request by JWS. And then we have uh, uh, some other documents that are not working group items that, uh, which are those three that we are going to talk about. Um, is there anything you would like to change? Some additional things to add or remove? Can we at least just list all of the RFCs we have since last time? Well, I'm, I'm uh, getting there. I'm getting okay. there. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, you, you guys oh, screw yeah. room. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So no uh, agenda changes. Tony, no, no, nothing special. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, I copied the status from the, uh, from the page as you've seen, uh, all the hard work, uh, paid off and we finally got these new, uh, documents published, uh, namely the, uh, there's another slide, um, the dynamic client registration and also the dynamic client registration management, which was uh, published recently. And then, um, we have a few other documents that are, uh, very far along um, to point out uh, the proof key for code exchange uh, is also in, R in the RFC editor queue. So will be available fairly soon. And also uh, the token introspection is, uh, is quite far along. Um, do you, uh, Justin, do you want to say something about that? Uh, no, it's all good. So uh, it's pretty much completed IESG review. There was one final discuss that was raised, and I actually uh, took the language of the person who raised the discuss and incorporated it into the draft. So I think it's now just a matter of aligning schedules and pushing buttons uh, before it moves on. It should should be fairly soon. Awesome. Good. And then um, you, you see my uh, sort of uh, added, added notes. Um, so two documents have completed working group last call. Uh, we are going to talk of, about those uh, briefly a little later uh, during this meeting. And we'll obviously discuss the documents that uh, still need to be worked on. But in general, I, th I think I'm pretty happy. Hmm? So this, um, the ones that I uh, indicate as working group last call completed, those are uh, uh, Derek, has uh, done the or has reviewed them and he has uh, provided comments to the list as a, as part of his shepherd review and um, that's what we are going to discuss yeah uh, let me let me kill this program yeah it can be confusing <laughs> Uh, Hannes, just one more. Uh, Jot is on that list as a new RFC since Dallas. Good point. Unless I'm getting my dates wrong. No, you're right. Okay. Okay. That's right, the assertion drafts. That's oh, right. You're right. You're so right. so we actually have, what, 
six. We have six new RFCs since last time. Yeah, you have um, right. plus Jose. So yeah, I will update the slides. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good page not found for the own. Yeah, I I wasn't just trying to say hoorah. The thing that I wrote made it through. There really was a lot. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff. Uh, so I would update that. Um, good. So we also got some errata. Uh, I hear the links in case you you don't know how to find them. Um, I think there are five uh, errata we need to look in, into. Uh, Kathleen pointed out to, to me that we should really get those done. And um, I talked to John before the meeting, and he volunteered to help me look at those. Uh, I will look at them and then uh, verify it with John. And together, we'll uh, post something to the list on how we uh, decided about those, whether we think they are uh, reasonable and valid, and, or whether we don't think so. So we get those uh, out of the way as well. Okay, um, and that brings me to the first item, Brian. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about OAuth 2 token exchange. Uh, I prepared these slides uh, with Mike Jones, but I'm going to run through them. He'll probably yell at me a little bit. Um, you'll help you. You'll sense a little bit of tension and some of the wording here, but um, that's what we're here to work through. So uh, <laughs> this is an exchange of ideas. Next slide, please. Um, so sort of the functional goals, one thing that's come up on the list recently is there's there's a couple of different drafts, but largely there's a draft that, that Mike wrote and a draft that I wrote um, that have some differences that we're going to talk about here, but they also have a lot of similarities, um, and they have a lot of similar goals. Some of those functional goals that we're trying to do is just some mechanism to exchange one token for another token, and to do so in a token type independent way, um, and something that works for both OAuth tokens and just sort of generalized security tokens. Uh, we also want to be able to describe from the requester's point of view uh, properties of the desired token, like request certain properties of what's going to be returned back to you uh, when it's appropriate. It's not always appropriate. Sometimes it's totally server policy or whatever. Um, some examples of that are these act as and on, on behalf of capabilities, ways to express delegation, um, kind of like WS Trust, and a way to, to say what scope values you're asking for. Um, you want to authenticate the involved parties when it's applicable. It's not always applicable. And um, I think the goal that we all share uh, is to keep the simple things simple. Next slide, please. So Hannes earlier in the week asked me about use cases, um, which I didn't have any in this presentation until he asked. I sat down to try to do it. Um, it, it turns out to be kind of hard to, to list out the use case for token exchange, largely because it's both um, really simple. You trade one token for another. Like, uh, it's not much harder than that, or it doesn't get a lot simpler than that. One in, one token in, one token out, really simple. Um, but it's also useful in a huge variety of circumstances. Oh. Sorry. Um, and that variety actually, uh, and the, the sorts of things you want to do with that variety actually end up making some of this uh, rather complicated. One really common thing people want to do with token exchange is, is some client needs to access heterogeneous systems. Um, sometimes it's cross-domain, sometimes it's internal heterogeneous systems. I will say that the assertion stuff is geared at being sort of a special case sort of token exchange that's very tightly profiled for the cross-domain functionality, um, but still generalized cross-domain token exchange is, is not uncommon. Um, there's also this Sometimes an expectation of impersonation or delegation, sometimes it's very explicitly stated, sometimes it's implicit in terms of who's acting for whom or, or what system's acting on behalf of another user. Um, Brian, could you hold the mic a little bit closer, please? Yes, sir, sorry. You may have to remind me. Um, and oftentimes that, that delegation is to a client, some system, delegating to a system, you're, you're 
the system's doing something on behalf of some other user. And sometimes it's to uh, another user, like uh, sort of a, a customer sales rep type scenario where I call in um, and I get a, a rep that accesses my account to figure out what's going on. And sometimes even in that delegation chain, both the, the user that's being acted on behalf of the user that's actually acting and the system that's doing all the stuff for them are represented in this. So it gets kind of complicated, which who's acting for who and when and whether they're a person or a system or both. Um, another common use case we've talked about a lot, and this is one that Phil and uh, Justin had earlier drafts trying to um, accomplish the same goals are this, uh, I'm not sure if it's the right word, but we came to call it edge device use case at the, uh, at the last meeting where there's some sort of proxy, reverse proxy or gateway that's accepting tokens inbound, usually an OAuth token, and wants to um, do something with that in order to prepare requests to, to sort of the backend services. It might be a, a translation for a token in like a heterogeneous type system, it needs something else. Um, might do chaining, it might do downscoping. Um, it might just want to validate it, make sure it's legitimate with some other system because it doesn't have sort of the what it needs to do to, to validate the token um, or some combination of all of those. So, like I said, it's kind of hard to express ex in detail all the exact use cases, but hopefully this gives an idea of sort of the general sort of needs that are addressed by, by uh, token exchange type use cases um, and give an idea that this really needs to be sort of a framework that allows for the definition of the, the exchange between the client and the server. Um, that is flexible enough to accommodate what a lot of different people are going to want to do with it, but at the same time can keep the simple use cases relatively simple. Uh, Phil Hunt, I just wanted to clarify, maybe not so much um, in our case, it wasn't really an edge device. I was thinking maybe an edge service, which is the customer facing service receives a request and that's the normal OAuth interplay. But then your service has to call another ser service in the background, which is a separate service. And the question is, do I just take that access token and pass it on or do I need to change it for something else, either for audit purposes or security cross domain purposes? But it was, in my sense, it was service to service. I, that was meant to be encompassed by the yeah. edge device thing. Yeah. Maybe the maybe the terminology is misleading, but yeah. I think you coined it, so I was trying to so, uh, trying to follow up with you there. So Tony Nadlin, our basic use case is we have Office 365, and you're accessing your mail, and you click on a link within the mail, and it needs to go off to the word to process a word document. And so that's so the Office 365 service needs access to the Word document, and that's a basic use case that the one the draft that um, was written by Microsoft solves. So that's that's our main instance where we have Azure, where we have our services, and the services need other services of other services, and that's you know pretty basic. And so Tony, they would exchange uh, that one doc token that came from the user agent uh, into something that is specific to that uh, service that stores that uh, word documents. Yeah. yeah. Similar to, to what um, uh, Phil just mentioned, just yeah, in a, yeah, in a different just, context. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, <laughs> uh, Justin Richer, uh, just to pile on here, yeah, the use case and um, and Steve, if you want to correct me when I do this, because it's actually Steve's fault that we built this in the first place. Um, uh, we basically had a bunch of uh, backend services that were fronted by a, a common front end, um, and the front end would basically get a, uh, a you know, sort of an all services token. Uh, it could downscope using refresh tokens and stuff, and uh, we needed to have that same capability for, you know, licensing and minimizing uh, security risk of uh, these big tokens going across the network, across all of these back end services. So uh, you have a front end that can call service A and B, and a back end service that can call uh, service B but not A, and it needs to get sort of the downscope token in order to do that. So it was all sort of service to service edge device. I think it was was kind of a. Um, I, I do think that one was Phil's fault, um, but I. <laughs> 
that's not my term. Uh, but no, it's, uh, but, uh, this is all really dealing with after a resource server gets a token, it needs another token to do something and it doesn't have access to the user. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe thanks for clarifying that, that, that the resource server sort of as the thing exchanging the tokens is I think a really common case. And that's what I meant to portray by edge device just because the wording had come up, but it's not, it's not the only use case. There are cases where there's an active client that has its own token um, from somewhere and needs to exchange it to access uh, some other service. So there's there's utility in both both models. That's what I was trying to sort of differentiate here, even if I didn't do a very good job of it. Anything else on, next slide. So just gonna talk about, I mentioned this before, two different drafts that are out there right now, um, just kind of compare and contrast and, and try to drive to some decisions or at least get people to the point where we can start driving to some decisions. Um, there's a lot of commonalities. Uh, right now, we're both using a new grant type at the token endpoint. We have parameters to express the types of tokens. Um, we have parameters for these act as and on behalf of things. We have parameters um, to represent the requested scopes. Where the parameters live is a, is a different thing, but there's, there's ways to express these types of things. Next slide, please. Um, so just gonna kind of go through the issues and decisions that, that uh, we think are necessary to kind of drive things forward. Um, and talk a little bit about proposed solutions and or at least highlight the, the different decisions that are available as we go forward. Next. Um, so this is really important to me. I wanna bike shot on the title a little bit. There's two options. One is OAuth2 token exchange. That's in the Jones draft. And then the other one that I have is OAuth2 token exchange, uh, an STS for the rest of us. Um, <laughs> So some observations on this. I like humor sometimes, especially in these dry documents. Uh, it's a joke, but it also conveys, at least in my mind, the, the goal of, of simplicity and using a modernized approach for, for some sort of token exchange. And like I said, this is really, really important to me. Next slide, please. I know and I, and I, yeah, I'm fear you're not joking. <laughs> I'm not, I, it's a joke, but I, I think it's a good joke. So I would like to see it in there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've got a laugh in the room. Uh, another issue, so this is actually a commonality between the two drafts. They both use the token endpoint right now as the point of exchange, but I, I wanted to bring it up a little bit um, and mention that using the token endpoint, there's probably value to it. Uh, currently, the assertion framework, um, the three RFCs we talked about earlier, all use the token endpoint, and this is currently deployed um, in practice, and, and it's being proved in deployments. It's working right now. I have a quote here from one uh, large service provider that it was easy to add this to our existing infrastructure. Um, I think largely because it kind of fell into the existing pieces and worked well. Um, there have been suggestions in the past to define a new endpoint. Um, I don't know how serious they were, but it's come up in the working group meetings from time to time. Um, and it, it sort of maybe in my mind falls out of some other decisions we might make or, or drives them one way or the other. So RFC 6749 OAuth2 framework, um, defines a re request response mechanism in a format for the token endpoint along with really what seem to be specific extension points. Um, in my view, the use of the token endpoint needs to work within that framework. If we wanna reuse the token endpoint, we need to stay within that framework for consistency and, and just meeting the, the normative standards of, this, of the base specification, which we're extending. Um, Mike said this here, that recognizing that different grant types can define different sets of parameters and both both these drafts do use a grant type. Um, so I think this is very clear for request parameters. The grant type is a request parameter. You give it a new direct grant type and that is allowed to define whatever request parameters you want. Um, it's a lot less obvious to me that it's, it's um, legal with response parameters. Um, I, I can't quote the doc offhand, but the, the RFC 6749 has, this is the token endpoint response. This is what it looked like. These are the must. So, um, Mike will challenge that now. No, no, I'm not challenging it. I'm adding data. Okay. That the reason <clears throat> I believe that 6749 already sets the precedent that different response type have different outputs is it defines two access token and refresh token, and they have different responses. They have some common elements, but one adds an additional output. Right, but and I don't want to bike shed this. I'll give one other piece of historic data. My first individual draft used a different endpoint, 
the working group told me use the token endpoint and I switched. Okay. And I, I actually, personally, I prefer the token endpoint. I just think that there are certain things that it demands of us to be consistent with the other spec. And, and I think we need to take a look at the text again and make sure that, that that's all right. Yeah, I agree with Brian. Um, and Justin, sorry. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Brian's read on this. And I do not believe that it's true that it already defines multiple responses. The response to a refresh token is an access token. Um, sometimes and sometimes the response to an access token request it also contains a refresh token so that's that's perfectly consistent but anyway i'm not sure if this is a duh or i'm jumping ahead it's phil here um the other when you talk about a different end different endpoint i was also thinking could be a completely different authorization server as well so it's it might be still the, the slash token endpoint but it's a different IP address, right? That's orthogonal. We're, we're talking about well, that's what it is an orthogonal thought, but I was kind of going, well, if I have a different endpoint, there might be a discovery problem and all of that. And I went, well, we already have that problem because yeah. assuming the client that wants to exchange the token must know the correct one. He doesn't care about where that token came from, but the point is he should already know what token endpoint he's getting it from exchanging it. it it's probably easier for discovery in certain configurations and things like that to have one endpoint, if that's where you're going with it. I, I agree. Uh, John Bradley Ping, we, I think the decision should be whether or not we want to keep exactly that format or whether we want to do of the token endpoint or we want to look at it as a clean slate because there are perhaps decisions that we've made in the past that might not be optimal in the in the new world. We should make that decision. I don't know that changing the response type should necessarily be something that we fixate on because certainly lots of things have finessed that open ID connect added an ID token based on a parameter. And so that may not be what the spec originally intended, but we, we may be able to, to finesse that. I think it's the, the larger what should we do question rather than worrying about necessarily the finer points of whether or not it's actually allowed in the RFC we can if it isn't allowed in the RFC then we can perhaps deal with that okay, but that's we fair. should we should make the the higher level decision based on what's the right thing to do and then figure out if there's something that needs to be tweaked in the RFC not let one reading or another of the RFC drive that decision taken yeah I, I, that sounds reasonable to me <laughs> Go to the mic. Let's move on with that next. Um, another issue is, is the means of how to authenticate the requester. Um, there's two sort of options here. One is a signature on the request, JWT, that is itself a, a parameter. That's how the Jones draft does it. The other one is to reuse OAuth client authentication um, and, and what's existing there. Some observations around this, uh, 6749 already provides a framework for client authentication. So it, it's, there's some niceness in that, including a way to do client authentication with a signature via the JWT assertion client authentication. Um, so you can do signatures either way. Um, oftentimes, uh, sometimes, oftentimes client authentication is not needed. You don't actually care about the identity of the client, you just need to know that a valid token came in, you validate it, and you send out a token based on the input token. So client authentication often not needed. Um, OAuth allows for unauthenticated and anonymous client access, so that's kind of covered nicely. In the Jones version, you can use um, a none alg in a JWT, which allows for roughly the equivalent. Um, so a key question here, at least uh, Mike's perspective, I think it is a question, is the requester always going to be an OAuth client? Um, if you're dealing with the authorization server, in my mind, you are an OAuth client and can be given appropriate identity there. But if we need to have some sort of means of authenticating something that's not an OAuth client, talking OAuth to the authorization server, then, then possibly something else is here. Uh, I will note that these two approaches aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. We could invent a client authentication scheme that signs over everything, or we could have two approaches. Um, I'm not a big fan of that, but it's possible. <laughs> And we might want to also consider, uh, I don't know, I wanted to mention that uh, regular OAuth tokens or, or pop type tokens here could be considered. Right. I, I just wanted to reinforce a point you were making that okay. our newly minted, um, thank you all, uh, 
5723 and 5722 for SAML uh, do give us a way to use an assertion to authenticate the requester. And if in that sense you think of it as an OAuth client, that's cool. I'm not so much worried about, uh, I, I knew that I wanted signatures to authenticate stuff when I wrote the draft a year and a half ago. Now we have a way to do it that's standard, so I'm good with that. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll make my point because apparently now I agree with Mike because a minute ago I thought I didn't. <laughs> uh, this is Justin. Um, I was just going to say that uh, if you are a piece of software and uh, you are speaking OAuth to an authorization server in order to get tokens, uh, if you're not an OAuth client and you're doing that, what are you? Because that's kind of how we define a OAuth client. So I think it's just, it's it's not even bike shedding at that point. It's just being really wonky with the language. So, so I no. think actually then we're all all agreeing about that. Um, yes, but it's a it's a it's a client of the token endpoint, and that's that's why yeah. Yeah, it's it's it changes. It's, it's full it's turtle. Wrong. Let's call a turtle a turtle. Is all I'm asking. I'm in favor of calling the turtle a turtle. But um, so what? Think, they, for those who haven't connected the dots, I think what's what we're saying here, though, is that um, in the case where a resource server has received an access token, in that relationship, it was not a client. But in the turtles all the way down, it now becomes a client. Exactly. And therefore, normally, we would expect it has a client credential for this new authorization <laughs> server, or it might not. But that's but I think that might be the head frame people are around when they're saying it's not an OAuth client, it's a resource server because they're still on the previous yeah. call. That's, that's, that's a good point. That's maybe something we should clarify uh, because this, this sort of role changes can often get uh, a little confusing. I think it's a, worth a clarifying point that at, that at that moment for that exchange, in some sense, it's sort of true of introspection. You are sort of, you are at, at, you, the resource server acts as a client for this exchange. And that, that might be a useful clarification. Thanks, Bill. And, and Brian, um, so the conclusion from that discussion, at least from what I hear, is that we just use the existing client authentication mechanism. Is that sort of the? I, I think we have rough consensus for that on this one. If we're using the token endpoint, it then it makes sense to use the authentication for the token endpoint. <laughs> You're right, but it's the, the token endpoint kind of gets weaved into a lot of these decisions. Right. So, so again, if we were we if we were to decide not to use the token endpoint, then perhaps some other method of auth authenticating yeah. the presenter of the token to be exchanged could be considered. But okay. But let's assume that make that sort of tentative assumption that is the the token endpoint for the moment. Uh, and then un unless we find out something else, is that, is that I, fair? I, I'm not actually advocating one way or the other because okay. I want to see the cage match, but you, you can guide us one way if you want. Yeah. But I think the cage match is going to come regardless. Yeah. Um, does, does anyone uh, have a different view on that on that issue? I'm, I'm just curious. Not at the moment. Good. Okay. So I think we're definitely looking at client authentication. We're leaning towards the token endpoint. Uh, we'll go on to some other ones. Next slide. Um, so this is this is maybe the more uh, uh, heated issue is the the format of the request itself. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I'll just go through it. So there's there's kind of two options we have right now. You want to head me off, Mike? I, I don't think it's heated anymore because the purpose of the request jot was, was to have a signed request coming in. Okay. And if we can put the signature okay. in, as a jot assertion, we're good. All right. All so. Right. Uh, so to, I don't think there is a cage match. Right. Okay. So uh, to to just add to that, one of the things because this was raised to the list, and so people uh, may not have caught this, um, is that one of the goals, as I understood it from the Jones draft, was to protect the input parameters with the same signature. Um, what I proposed on the list, and I think that uh, we could do very well with, is to have a general mechanism for signature protecting request to the token endpoint, analogous to and perhaps based on what Nat is going to talk about if we ever finish this in a few minutes, um, with a request to the authorization endpoint. I think that if we have something in parallel, it'll give us all of the functionality that we need and then some 
with a general mechanism. I agree with you if we want to do that. And the, yeah, if, the if is the part I'm not sure about since these will oftentimes be direct, direct client to server. I'm not sure how much it adds. <clears throat> Um, Mike Jones, in my mind, the reason I don't want to touch the authorization endpoint is that's interactive, where the token endpoint is not interactive. Yeah, I wasn't saying that. I was saying that just as the definition of the request object uh, is used to protect input parameters to the authorization endpoint, we could define a mechanism within OAuth to signature protect input parameters to the token endpoint. So it's an analogy. I'm not saying we should use the authorization endpoint. Uh, Mike, again, I kind of think that we've already got TLS to keep them bound together, and I'm a happy enough guy. I, again, I think we're converging. No, no, I, I think, Mike, uh, um, I think what um, what is being proposed here is, is simply to take the work that Nat has done with the uh, request object for the other specification for the other endpoint and just copy it as a, as a concept uh, to this problem, as a solution to this problem, not actually to no. do anything with the other endpoint, right? Well, the last part's right. Um, uh, not to do anything with the, other, with the authorization endpoint, um, but I'm saying that if that is something we really care about, and I'm hearing from multiple parties that it's not actually something that we care about for solving this problem right now, then I think that that's the way we should tackle it. Uh, that said, um, I don't think I'm, I'm with Mike. I don't think that it's actually necessary for solving this token thing. And I think that we can uh, gin up a uh, a way to do. I don't know. Maybe a signed HTTP request with a detached uh, signature based on JWS. Just a thought that uh, we could actually uh, use here. That sounds. Right. Sounds crazy, huh? So we, yeah. do, we don't think we need it. We'll have right. other ways of addressing it later if we do. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Move on, Brian. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> My esteemed colleague has something oh. to say. Um, John, I, yeah, I, I don't know that binding is necessarily required, perhaps optional in the, in the way that uh, Justin just mentioned. If we have a way of signing messages for presenting to the resource server, perhaps that can be reused. I don't know that the si request by JWT, I think that's just a completely orthogonal thing. But I think we can, we can, go ahead, go, go ahead. Yeah. Brian. So I think we've converged. No, we haven't. Well, converged. Uh, so what is the? So you presented three different options. Which one do we? Did I hear that we converged to? And I, have, oh, I would like sorry. to ask a hum to to the uh, rest of the room to actually confirm what you think you've heard. Okay. So I didn't actually present three different options. Um, there are three different options here. One is the content of the request rolled up into a J.WT that is itself a request parameter, uh, just using straight form form parameters um, that you'd normally see at the token endpoint or possibly doing a full-on JSON uh, request in the body, um, which, which would, like dynamic client registration, that really would demand a, a, a new endpoint. What I think I'm hearing from the room is that we're converging on form request parameters. If you're gonna do a hum, I'll go on that. Do you want, do you want to do a hum anyway? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so, um, so the, the question is, uh, do you do you agree that we should uh, the request the format of the request should use these format form request uh, parameters? Uh, if you if you agree, raise your hand. Raise hands. hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not not. Hmm. What, what is the, what is the, so I'm trying to find out on what for the form for form request parameter. Okay. Okay. Um, so who's in favor of the first option where we use the, uh, the JWT for encoding? No Nobody. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, who's in favor of the second uh, approach, the form request parameter encoding? You don't hum, raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. And six. And who's, who's in favor of the uh, last option, the JSON request body? 
Okay, I think that was pretty clear. Um, <laughs> I think so it's number converge. it's number two, the form requires parameters, uh, Eric, for the minutes. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Next slide then, please. Uh, this doesn't matter anymore. This is, re it's related. Next slide, please. Ah, this is a good one. Okay, so format of the response. Uh, both drafts now use JSON, um, which is, I think, good. Uh, the Jones draft uses uh, two, two uh, members, security token and security token token. I'm sorry. You're a little nervous in front of all you really good looking and intelligent people. Um. <laughs> so the, the Jones draft, they both return JSON. The Jones draft has two members, security token and security token type. Uh, both useful. Um, and then the my draft uses the standard RFC 6749 um, response from the token endpoint, um, and it adds an additional security token type member in it to convey information about the return token type. Um, some observation here, uh, in my view, reuse of the, the parameters is, this is not my view, <laughs> reuse of them is, is confusing to some and, and perfectly natural to others. I don't know how to get over that. I've seen both both people's reactions on the list and in person, some people find it obvious and, and very natural, others think it's confusing. Um, I do think that token type, which is in our world bear versus pop, really just bear right now, but eventually pop, is a useful thing to, to tell clients about the return token in case they don't know much else about it. It instructs them how to use it at the next target resource. Um, uh, expires in can similarly be useful. It, it gives a hint to the to the client about how long this token is good for, how long they can use it without, without having to re-up or, or get an error in order to find out that they have to get a new one. And scope can be useful too if it's different than what was requested. Um, oh yeah, thank you. And so on the other side, this is this is sometimes often unnecessary since the information is typically encoded in the token itself. Um, which is which is almost always true, but sometimes the token is opaque to the client either because it's some reference data, or the client just doesn't know how to tear it apart. Um, but it is it it's often intrinsic to the token. It's just a matter of whether the client has access to it or not. Um, so here we have a good one. So in one interpretation of 6749, um, the completely different set of request parameters would necessitate the use of a new endpoint. Sorry, thank you. Response parameters would necessitate the use of a new endpoint because it's a departure from what's in there now. Um, in another interpretation, the, the, the same endpoint can be used with a completely different set of response. So we, we, we're at an impasse there. Um, I think it's maybe a question we should, maybe we'll talk about now. Um, yeah, one of those interpretations is correct and the other is not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, Oh, you really want to know what I really feel? No, you don't. Um, anyway, uh, I do think that uh, going back to the previous discussion of the fact that in this particular slice, even though it is generally a resource, resource server that is doing this call, it is acting as an OAuth client. It is assumed throughout OAuth that what is in the token is opaque to the OAuth client. And in some cases, even though a resource server is pulling down uh, this token, it may be opaque to that resource server if it's being targeted and audienced to a remote resource server. I've seen people do this both with just purely opaque randomized tokens and also encrypted payload tokens that um, the client, the resource server client, I guess we need new terms now, um, pulling this down wouldn't actually be able to get in. Therefore, the token type expires in all of that stuff, I think is actually useful to have on the outside. And also, uh, you know, calling it an access token uh, or putting it in the access token field. Uh, I remember that being one of the other contentions. It, it's what it is. There's the rub. Because uh, Mike Jones, there's actually two cases. And I think recognizing, I mean, part of me getting my head around why we had a different view at first was realizing there's two cases and they're different. Uh, the WS Trust style, uh, none of the tokens are opaque. They're SAML tokens generally. That's In this world, they could be JOT tokens. You know the type. You know how to parse them. Now, in the special OAuth case, they are opaque. 
to certain parties. And so if what you're getting back is an access token, yeah, probably treat it like an access token. But if what you're getting back is not an access token, but is a general security token assertion, which probably can't be used as an access token or a refresh token, it's something else intended for something else, then calling it an access token is just really confusing because it's not an access token. So one point of clarification though, is WS Trust definitely can use opaque tokens and it has fields outside of the token itself to express exactly these concepts. That's right. And in some sense, I don't mind if for some of the responses, some of these other parameters show up, but I don't want a mandatory in our token exchange spec. So I think, so I think then the, the real point of disagreement is simply about the name of the returned token. Yeah, because all the other ones are optional. So it's up, yeah. it's, it's up to the server whether they and, include them And to not. me, the, the reason the confusing word there appears is if what you're getting back is not an access token, which is one of the use cases, calling it an access token is just going to hurt people's heads. So I, I'm sympathetic, but I disagree. And you're still using and this token is to, to, to access things. And John's going to speak next, but this is to John's. I'm trying to do what makes sense, not what just well, I under, I understand. syntactically reading 6749 would have us do. I understand that. Okay. So can I do this rather than – we could have our own argument over here. But um, – so John Bradley, again, for the remote uh, participants. Uh, so first, agreeing with Justin, um, we have a principle in OAuth that the clients do not introspect, don't, don't get to see the tokens. They're, 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 they're opaque to the client. Sniffing SAML tokens is as bad and evil and causes all sorts of other um, potential problems. We don't want to repeat a mistake that has been made other places. We should keep the information that's going to the thing requesting it versus the actual audience for the token separate. So um, there's, and there's all sorts of good reasons. We don't want to start mucking into that. Um, having the additional information that the requester needs as separate parameters is good. Having them optional is perfectly fine. And I agree that it's confusing to reuse the same parameter name, but we do have a token type response is going to say hopefully what what kind of token it is. So getting overly fixated about the fact that it says access in the token name, perhaps we chose the wrong parameter name at the outset. If we're going to reuse the token endpoint, I don't know that there's a perfect answer to that. Yeah, I think it's now syntax and we just have to make a call. Yeah, I actually, um, I agree with Justin and, and John on that specific issue. I think we have to take into it. Oh, Hannes, yeah, uh, Hannes, um, because uh, because exactly of the, the issue that we discussed uh, earlier on the, the change of roles in that exchange, and I think that makes it much clearer on why this is the right approach. <laughs> okay, I, th I think I scared Phil away. Uh, this is Justin. Um, so I think something that actually might help here is that uh, if we were to syntactically reuse access token, um, but define a new token type response, not security token type, that's, that's a different thing, but define a new literal token type value such that it is not an RFC 6750 access token, would that be sufficient in clearing the confusion? Because a non-OAuth client, which I don't know why we're talking about non-OAuth things in this working group, but Legacy OAuth? No. Uh, but anyway, a non-OAuth client will know to look for that special thing, and when it sees that specific value that gets defined here, it could do the special processing. Would that help? It's, it's worth considering, or we could just define that if the OAuth token type output <coughs> parameter is missing, that it's not what you thought it was. This is syntax. Yeah, it's 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 syntax, syntax, and I I, I think there is a it. way. I think there is a way out. Right. Having I mean, worst comes to worst, we would write very clear language saying that if 
and maybe we want to hum on this, but if the thing ends up using the string access underscore token, we'd need very clear language saying this name is here for historic reasons and the, this does not always contain an access token. I, sh I shrugged for the remote participants. It, that makes sense. It, it, I... That sounds like to me like another call. Uh, so, um, Phil, Phil, hello, no. Phil. No. Go, go. no side conversation, guys. No. John, no, you need him. Um, so, uh, you, I, are we wrapped up with that specific issue, or do you? Okay. Yeah, so the two options, I believe, are, what are the two options that we could go for? Brian. Microphone, yeah. The, the options listed on the, on the slide, basically new, new parameters or, or use of existing parameters to find an OAuth. Does that capture it? And with some syntactic stuff maybe to be considered, Justin's, your proposal is, I think, worth talking about. Okay. Well, maybe not deciding right now. No, no, it's, that's okay. You can, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the, the, basically the questions are, so there's the two, these two options. Let's focus just on the two options. And then, uh, the reuse, the first option is, uh, the reuse of existing, uh, parameters as we discussed in, um, that was what you, Justin, uh, proposed. And the second one is um, the definition of ex new parameters, as you, Mike, proposed. So I start with the first one. So who's, uh, I, raise your hands, uh, who's in favor of reusing the existing uh, options as, as uh, okay. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, okay, eight, eight persons. And then um, who's in favor of uh, defining new parameters? Raise your hand. One, two, okay, two. So I think um, that is clear as well. So we stick with the existing parameters. That makes sense as an option. Yeah. Or Make, figure another way around. Yeah. Uh, and some explanatory text. Sure. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the issue here is indicating the, the target of the requested token. Sometimes the client um, might have different resources it wants to talk to downstream or across stream or whatever. Uh, giving the requester the ability to indicate where it wants to use the token um, is useful unless the server apply policy, whether to deny it or approve it, as well as how to sign it, what attributes to include it, all those sorts of things. Um, so I use the odd parameter, uh, which is in the pop key distribution to represent this. Um, it's currently required, but I got some feedback uh, that it should be optional. And when I reread it being required, I don't know why it was. It should be optional, so I'll make it optional in whatever, however it ends up in the draft. Um, it, we need something, I guess, is kind of where this comes down to. Yeah, Mike's okay with it. I, I, I think actually now that I think about it, the question of whether to use odd or not uh, is, or whether using target or something completely different is, is a worthwhile question, uh, particularly with the status of uh, key distribution a little bit fuzzy, um, but it did seem to fit. And I, I also think the parameter itself, this is a kind of a sidebar, but I think it has a lot of utility outside of the key distribution piece. I've already implemented in my OAuth authorization server for non-POP tokens because it helps distinguish how you want to construct the, server, the token for the resource server. Um, it, so it was actually a, a parameter proposed uh, independently initially, and it was just copied into the uh, Oh, can, token we, because, uh, can we go back? Oh, yeah. So we can go uh, back in time. Sure. This or, is, or can we reintroduce it somehow right. so it's it's generally applicable? Or even right. This is so this is Justin. I just wanted to uh, to echo that. I do think it has general applicability, and I think that's something we got wrong with OAuth two, and we're just kind of now realizing it. With actually, a of I years. realized it already way back then when I said <laughs> we just reuse what Kerberos did, and people said, ah, but we don't need that. 
it seemed like a good idea at the time. We were idiots. We're slightly less idiots now. Um, but no, I do think that it has general applicability um, beyond this. And I think that we as a working group should decide when and how we're going to define this because we already have a couple of implementations of OAuth that have an audience claim uh, equivalent as required on right. their endpoints, uh, somewhat famously Microsoft. And um, this is this is something that people want. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, Uma has invented its own way to manage this kind of thing. Um, and we ob very obviously need it. We just need a way to define it so that everybody can use it. Could this be a fast track speclet edition? I don't know. Um, just Mike Jones providing data behind what Justin said about Microsoft. <clears throat> yeah, the, is the, the resource The Microsoft parameter. OAuth yeah. server has a resource parameter where you say, this is the resource that I'm asking for a token for. Now, we you had to take that out for connect because it's already implicit, but um, I understand why they did that. Um, whether that's an audience or not, I would have to wrap my head around. As Justin, again, it's how people use audience and resource is very, very analogous to each other. It's very, it's it's almost indistinguishable in the cases that I've seen it. So that, that may be. I just want to wrap my head around it. That's fine. so maybe um, uh, that's a that's a good observation, Brian. Uh, and and uh, I'm Justin. I'm I'm a little slow today. Sorry. Uh, so I was. So I, I, is it worthwhile to ask a question whether other people agree with that observation that we should define this as a generic uh, parameter? Um, yeah, maybe why not? Um, so, so do you think that we should uh, define this this audience parameter or whatever we want to call it uh, as a generic object that is then applicable to both the token exchange but also uh, useful for the uh, proof of possession work? Uh, if you think so, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It, it's also 10 useful to just vanilla OAuth. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, if you object, raise your hand. Zero. Okay. Uh, so that's so good. We Maybe we. So should, we we, we basically resurrect. Uh, we strip it out of here. Strip it out of pop. Uh, and. Uh, Sort of revert back to where we started some years ago. It's a, it's a very short uh, description, so it's I mean, not. Just uh, wear, <clears throat> excuse me, wearing Mike Mike Jones, wearing my Microsoft hat again, uh, for a moment. If we're going to do this, I'll at least try to make the case that we call it what Microsoft already has deployed, which is resource. Doesn't have to stay that way. If it means something different, I want a different name. But if it means the same thing, there's already a name in widespread production. I'm not passionate about the name. But <laughs> yeah, possibly passionate, Dave Robin. Um, we are actually using, in Backnet Web Services, actually using audience in an important way, distinguished from resource. Um, audience is the machine, the resource server that I'm sending this to it has nothing to do with the resource. Audience and scope are what allow me to access any resource that happens to match that audience and scope. So the resource path is irrelevant in the token, but audience is very important. And, and we, it's separate even yet again from resource because we use it for groups. So an audience can be a group. So this and every every device every resource server that claims to be part of that group, this audience is used to say this is for you. Oh, and for you. Oh, and for you. With scope foo foo foo, resource be damned. It doesn't matter. But so audience is really important, and it is audience. It has it's nothing to do with resource. So I don't want to I, I mix. I don't want to mix those two. At I, all. I, I think we have the same notion of what it is. We just have different uh, ways to call it. This is Mike Jones. I think they are different. One is for the recipient. The other is about where the recipient is going to use the resulting token. So the the, no, 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 no. Um, the client is neither. 
uh, Phil Hunt, uh, I, I, I agree with your concerns, Mike, but I think if that came over to our side, they would quickly interpret it not as an audience kind of thing, but as a, this is the, the resource I'm targeting for this access. Um, cause that keeps coming up because people keep asking, where is the resource parameter? Uh, which is very different from your interpretation. So it might be worthwhile for the group considering actually having both and they're both optional. To me, audience means potentially a resource, but it could also mean a domain. Um, this is going to this set of servers defined by this abstract URI. Um, so to me, there's, there's, there's overlap, which is the Microsoft case, but there can also be two distinct yeah. requirements. It's, it's maybe, um, so it would be important from a security point of view to have the semantics very clearly defined because you ultimately want to, uh, at the party who receives that token, you want to double check, you need to do a comparison operation. Am I really the one who is supposed to get it? And if it's, maybe it's the, it's the same as your FQDN, maybe it's, uh, some other generic parameter, which is sort of an opaque string, sort of like a, just a string that you compare and assign to a specific group of servers, or it's yet some other thing that obviously makes a huge difference. So John Bradley. So, um, as one of the people who perhaps came up with audience and, and, and odd in this case for ID tokens. My audience odd is intended as an identifier for the receiver that the receiver recognizes at, as itself. I think my, Microsoft's resource case is more like some other cases, which is the locator for the endpoint at which the, the audience receives the token because in some cases there may be more and there is that distinction in SAML, which of course confuses many people um, all the time. Um, they, they mean slightly different things and audience perhaps means even more confusing things if you actually read the SAML specs um, around policy stuff. But in, in at least in, the use in Connect was, in Connect, it's typically in an ID token. It's used to identify the client that is the, the, abs, the client ID, which is the abstract name for the client, because a client typically doesn't have an endpoint. You know, it's getting it via via its request. So, yeah. in this, so we we may actually want to have both, but we hmm. need to have that that yeah. that discussion. It, yeah, we probably need to have the they, discussion. They are they are slightly different things. I agree yeah. with with Mike, if, as long as we can agree that though it is those two things. So some people do overload audience and to use the URI for that is the endpoint of the thing. So that's why uh, they get so, so Mike Jones, just in order to move us along, I think we'll observe that there's agreement that we need to do something in this space and it's more complicated than we should design in the room. I concur. Okay. Okay, back to token exchange. Uh, another issue, the terminology act as, uh, this is a hard one to follow up with, on behalf of terminology. So some people uh, find the WS trust based uh, terminology confusing. Um, I'll say even confusion around who's confused about what has been confusing. Um, <laughs> so a couple different solutions, <laughs> I, I'm confused about it. <laughs> uh, uh, one one solution is is to keep things as they are, but but show really concrete examples that kind of show what it means and how to do it. I mean, I think no matter what we name them, it needs this needs to happen because it helps people understand things, um, as well as textual changes around that are consistent with that. Uh, another solution that's been thrown out there is to use completely new terminology. Um, uh, maybe for for those who hadn't followed the discussion on the list, could you uh, try to just yeah, no or. Try to describe what uh, the difference between act as on behalf of is. I will try. So they're meant to be ways to express whether the token you're asking for is a token where you're going to impersonate a user, literally be them in the token at the next thing. So a client has a token for Hannes and he gets another token that's for Hannes for some other system. And when that system consumes it, that's all it knows is this is a token about Hannes. 
Um, I believe in the old WS Trust parlance, that is on behalf of. Act as, a little bit confusing in my mind, maybe it's not, I don't know, but act as was meant to be a way to express not only does this does the client want a token doing something for Hannes, but he wants a, a composite token that represents both Hannes and the client's identity. So when he uses that token downstream, the system consuming it is aware of the context in which that token was granted, that, that this client is doing something for this user, but is also this client at the same time, is itself at the same time. I, I've also heard use cases, or these people throw it out on the list where um, they want to have the same kind of functionality, but Mike is doing something for me, even though he's operating at a client. So there's sort of personal delegation as opposed to the system type, type delegation. Um, that gets confusing, but I, I think it would be allowed for in the framework that we kind of have now, but um, I don't know. Did that help at all? I, I, I think there's, and they, they get switched around a little bit, and depending on how you read it, the sort of natural English language interpretation of it isn't quite consistent with the functional interpretation of it. Um, so this is Justin. Um, until just now, I actually thought they were the other way around. And there's a, there's and a, I think I've gone back and forth, and there's but a I'm not sure. decent chance I right. got it backwards. So, but but I wanted, to, but I I wanted to uh, inject for the Unix nerds in the room. Um, one of these, I'm not even going to hazard which one, uh, but one of these is effectively SU. You're switching user and acting completely as them, and nobody knows how you came in. And the other is pseudo. Uh, you are uh, switching, but only for the course of the context of this one thing, and we know where you came from as per all of the system logs. Okay. So I don't know if we want pseudo tokens instead, but uh, all I know is that every time these get brought up, nobody knows which is which but it's kind of clear that there's two. So um, I think that Brian did a good job explaining the two kinds of semantics. I will admit off the top of my head, I can't tell you which is which either. <laughs> but um, I, th I think I know, but I'm not going to say because I'm just, I'll get it wrong. But I think it is incumbent upon us as we describe this to be very clear which is the I'm just subsuming your identity case, and which is the, I'm still myself, but I have delegated rights from this other party. And semantically, they're very distinguishable if you, you know, know that that's a possibility, and we just need to be clear which is which. I agree. And in, in the way that I tried to write them, it's clear in my mind, it, it might not be in everyone's, but you know, I'd like, we can work on the text, was that the there's an input parameter that's on behalf of, and that's the token that represents the person that you're going to be acting on behalf of no matter what. And that's always required. That's always the input token. If there's also an act as token, you're, you're supplementing the context saying, by the way, I'm doing something on behalf of the on behalf of token, but I am going to act as this entity. Um, I don't know if that's strictly consistent with WS Trust, but it, it felt, but it represents, it's a way to get a composite token using both. I see head shaking. We don't have to go that way. I was trying to explain it. Okay. I mean, I, unless we've got a reason to differ, given this is already in the rocket science realm, I want our use of the parameters to be the same as WS Trust, or we're going to hurt other people's heads. Our, our explanations have to be better than WS Trust did. The, so the, the only problem in my mind with that is that we have to understand WS Trust, and it's it's not entirely clear. And one, to me, Tony will differ. One one confusing piece of WS Trust is that they're all optional, so you never know where to put a token. And I was trying to address the the simplicity factor by having one place to put a token all the time and a way to augment that um, in in right. cases where you need other functionality. Uh, so this is Justin again, not to jump to the bottom of the slide, but I think this discussion and every discussion about this on the list tells me that we just need to pick new terminology. It can be semantically equivalent to the two cases uh, within WS Trust, but I don't think anybody understands which term goes which. And it's obvious, it's obvious to me that it's not obvious from the terms what the semantics are that apply to those. We should just pick new names and be done with it. 
Yeah, I, Phil, and here, more, I want to... The more different terms there are for the same thing, the worse we've made the overall ecosystem. I, I, better explaining... We're, we're, we're better off explaining the existing terms well than having parallel terminology that's intended to mean the same thing but uses different words. Uh, um, Phil Hunt, I, I, I would agree with you in general, but I think this one is still after so many years, I still have to go look up the spec every time. And that sort of tells me we might have crossed the line on this one. <laughs> and we really need, it may be really hard to find out new terms, but one of the problems I have is for some, as an English person, I read those as, as the same phrase. So <laughs> um, I think it crosses the line and I would, I would prefer a uh, new terminology if we can come up with it. Tony Nadlin, so I'm mixed on new terminology or keep the old terminology, but if you go back and look at the terminology that we chose from chose for WS Trust, it was based upon the Kerberos terminology at the time. So if you look at our Kerberos de definitions, you'll see act as and you'll see on behalf of, and they mean the same thing. So it was taken from our implementation of Kerberos and Windows, and that's that's why we did these things in in WS Trust. Uh, William Dennis, I, I guess my uh, interpretation of on behalf of means that I'm, you know, anyone is aware of what I'm doing. I'm acting on your behalf, but I'm not making a secret of that. That that's at least how I interpret in English. Um, if we're going to keep the same words, should we at least get a consensus on on what they mean, rather than? Like, 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 from an English point of view, not, not, not in terms of the history, but I, I think that's part of the problem is, is that from an English perspective, there's a lot of dis. I don't even know if there's disagreement. Most people would interpret them in the English language perspective as being contrary to the, the, the way that they were used previously, and there's a desire expressed anyway to use them as they've been used in the past, and and those things are in conflict. So I don't, I don't know how to. Okay. I, I, well. Yeah, this, this I, I would probably support the English representation because yeah. um, I don't I don't know why we have to be held back. Um, I... Matt Miller, it's pretty clear to me we don't know what the hell we're talking about. So let's just pick <laughs> new terms, move on with our lives, and be happy for it. Um. So. <clears throat> so um. Brian, Brian, so uh, what are you going to do to improve the situation? <laughs> this is this is Justin. I would I would suggest picking new term, coining new terms, and seeing if everybody hates them any more than the ones we already have. Because sitting on this nebulous cloud of oh maybe this new term will be worse isn't helping the discussion, and we're just sitting here debating whether or not somebody read the Kerberos documents right. Phil is in favor of bike shedding on the names. But, but uh, not not just the names, but also the, the, the description. I think this needs to be crystal clear. No, no, I think it's actually pretty clear that we've got two things. Um, it's It really is we just need to pick names. And my suggestion to the editor uh, would be to just pick new names so that we can figure out as a working group whether that is worse or not. That's my suggestion. So I, I think that's a good suggestion. So, There's a number of different editors, so we'll, we could confer on terms and try to make something reasonable and then bring that back to you all and see, if, see how much you hate them. So John, I, I think that we actually are clear that we want two behaviors. One is impersonation, and the other is a composite for auditing purposes of who requested the token and who gave them permission to request the token. I think that. Everybody knows we want that. We just, the, it, the language, what we call them is, is hanging us up. So as long as we all agree we want those two behaviors, we should just leave it to the editors to come up with some sort of sensible names and sensible descriptions. We could probably do the descriptions now. We just can't decide what to call them. Yeah. So that, that sounds like a good proposal to me. So you come up with something and propose it to the list. And ideally, as soon as possible. The editors. The editors, the editors will do that. Could soonish possible thank you next slide
this is really simple. We need some way to indicate names or IDs for um, actual OAuth tokens, both in and out. Um, there's been two different things, basically, whether to use the short names from the existing spec or, or go ahead and define um, long URIs. Uh, I don't, either one's good. Short's probably nice. A lot of places now we talk about URIs, so we'd have to weasel word it. Um, maybe we could we could also say something like, if it's not a URI, if there's not a, a, a semicolon in it, then presume the, the, the standard sort of OAuth prefix for the URI. That might be a way to make them URIs, allowing the short names where appropriate. Um, but we need the functionality. I, I don't know if we want to even. All right, good enough. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, defining an actor claim. Um, do we need some way of making a claim that one party can, in fact, act for, for the other party, the issuing party? Um, this is useful for evaluating certain kinds of delegation requests. Uh, be something in a in a JWT um, that that maybe the JWT stuff could be defined in this draft, independent of the draft. I mean, part of the draft, but in a JWT only section. And, and if other token types need it, we could define it. Uh, it's currently in in the Jones draft, not in the Campbell draft. Um, it's probably useful. Um, I think it is useful. I think it, it needs a little bit of refinement. Probably involves in those examples. Um, and whatever we do, we need to maintain the token type independence of the draft overall, which. I, it, so, it's an observation. It's not necessarily hard. Tony Nadlin. So as far as this is concerned, one of the reasons why we did the signing was just for this was for this particular reason. So in putting it into a jot. So the signature with a proof of possession says that you can act for this particular person. That's why that's why we did it the way we did it. So and that's what's happened in WS Trust also. So it is a proof of possession type of model, not, a, not necessarily another set of claims. How did, how did Kerberos do that? Did it also, I remember it also had something in there, but, but it may not be, I, I don't remember what it was. Do you remember? It was a signature, so. What's the same, okay. To, to be. Uh, this is Justin, so. Um, to me, this uh, really feels like it's encroaching upon uh, distribution of policy across the network um, in a way that no longer keeps it opaque to the OAuth transaction. John Bradley, I'm, uh, we, we certainly have to do a, put a lot of thought into this, how the, the intersection of proof of possession and these token, these token, opaque tokens, what have you. Um, I think there is a separate use case, you know, what a composite token in SAML is, you're going to get every person you, every SAML expert you ask will give you three different opinions, um, how they're going to represent that. If we want any sort of interoperability in the JOT syntax, I think there is a JOT, separate JOT use case for, well, how do you represent the subject versus the presenter, et cetera, if you want to make claims about the presenter versus the subject? So I think separately in as a JOT extension, it makes sense to define, well, what would a composite token look like if you actually want to do it interoperably? Um, but I think that's probably separate from the actual token translation. So Mike Jones, <clears throat> let me respond to Justin's remark about uh, opaqueness. This would be used in a token that's an input to the token request, and it's not opaque to the party doing the token exchange. This is a statement by the entity that they're okay with another entity impersonating them or acting on their behalf. Let me finish. Okay. And so... Uh, it might be the case under certain policies and not under others that in order for the impersonation or delegation to be granted, you would have to provide proof as an input to the exchange that the party you're going to act for consented. That's what this claim is for. Uh, this is Justin again. Um, so. Yeah, I get that. And I think that uh, because of that, 
it's it's kind of an orthogonal separable piece. Um, so uh, I think defining it as an input claim here might be mucking up the water more than it needs to. Uh, it's falling off. Uh, Tony Nedland. So I would agree with Justin that the just yeah I know this is I take it back. <laughs> This is just a ploy to get you to agree with Mike. No, um, I would agree. <laughs> I would agree um, that this borders on the distribution of policy, and it should be up and it should be up to the servers to do what they want to do with what's provided. This is going in the wrong direction. And what we did was we provided the signature. You can use the signature if you wanted to, or you're not. But we're not distributing any policy. We're just signing it and letting the server pick up the signature or the pop if they want to use it as right. as proof and not this is just going down a rat hole. John. <laughs> you think that's going to save you? John Bradley, I was actually re talking about a different rat hole, which was the output token and expression to the actual you're getting, you're asking for a composite token. How do you actually put the claims in? If you're asking for a JWT as a composite token, how do you actually get a token out that multiple people could understand? So I was, I was talking about the, the actor uh, in the output so that you could have multiple receivers actually understand. So that has to be done in combination. So I think that's specific to the, the, the JWT output and then we also have to overlay the the signatures and and proof of possession stuff on top of that, which is more of a generic issue. I think John, you're right that in order to even do these wonderful examples that we're talking about, we're going to have to have sufficient claims in the JOT context to represent the dual identity tokens, whatever we call them. So I think that's work that is in the core path. Hmm, Brian, if I have to ask a question, I would have no idea what I should ask now. Do you know? Good, because I wouldn't know how to answer it. Um, <laughs> I, so what, what is your takeaway? What is, what's your takeaway from, from that discussion now? I, this is Justin. I think I can actually phrase this as a three-part question, um, if the chair should like to ask it. Uh, the first is, do we keep the actor claim as it is? Uh, that's one option as it is in the Jones draft. Two, uh, do we defer the actor claim off onto one other piece of work, uh, sort of spin off that bit, and maybe some uh, some of the other Jones draft uh, claims and proof of possession can kind of roll that up, because like Tony was saying, it's really all tied into the sign signature presentation anyway. Um, or three, do we just um, forget about it entirely? We drop it from this draft and make no particular effort to pick it up again. Mm. The, the worry that I have is um, that at this point in time, we may not necessarily know, um, understand the full complexity around it to, to have the big picture to actually answer those questions. I think just dropping or, or, or keeping in there may be a little too simplistic given at least what the, all the discussions that we just had. I, what, what I, I, would... wouldn't, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering a yes or no right now. I don't know what you right. guys feel. Maybe that's the question I should be asking. Uh, or let you so, so Mike Jones, even as the person who wrote the text, I'm not advocating keeping it as is. Uh, that's a syntax kind of thing. I'd rather push it to the editors to work out the semantics of how we represent in the examples the, the two identity tokens that we're going to need to make this work. And then as we find that we need claims for that, we take them to the working group and say, this is what we're thinking. So and this so, was just part of that, but it's not complete in and of itself. Okay. So maybe maybe ask, um, and maybe it's just me uh, who sort of is a little slow on this, but uh, who, who feels comfortable to make a decision about uh, these actors claim, whether it's kept in there or, or has to be or should be dropped uh, or moved into a separate document? Based on the discussion we just had and, and the content and the document, raise your hand if you if you think that you have all the information you need to make a decision. Oops, that's pretty clear. <laughs> Do you have enough, enough info to? 
No, no. No, no, I'm not, don't want to go there. Um, no, that's okay. Yeah, exactly. The editor should uh, provide a little bit more context around it so we. We'll try to work through it and, and probably during the course of that, find out more about what it is and whether it's really needed. Yep. And come back to okay. all you fine people with that when the time's appropriate. Let's try to finish this up. Next slide. Um, this is kind of hard. There probably needs to be some mechanisms to handle POP tokens here. Um, both for input and output tokens, uh, and independently, sometimes one or the other, um, not necessarily both. Um, for output tokens and key negotiation, I, I think the consistent use of the token endpoint syntax and semantics allows for relatively straightforward um, incorporation of whatever comes out of POP key distribution, assuming that's using the token endpoint and remains reasonable. Um, for input tokens, uh, we maybe need to consider existing proof of possession proposals um, that are that are in flight, HTTP request signing, uh, whatever uh, Nat and um, Keeping are going to talk about a little bit later. Um, I don't know other ways. I'd rather not. I'd like to use what's possible, and um, but it, it's sort of an open question right now. Um, some of these use cases get really complicated really quickly. The the so-called edge device use case or the resource server um, dealing with proof of possession tokens. Who's proving what to who? Um, and how I, we had a little talk before this meeting. I had a big argument with John about this, um, it, but it, I think it gets almost too complicated to, to even try to deal with, um, but it's an open question at this point. Um, and I'm a little concerned over introducing dependencies um, in between specs, particularly on the pop work, because I, maybe it's just because I started working on it recently again, but I'm, I'm confident we can move some of this token exchange stuff forward relatively quickly. and. Um, Historically speaking, with the, the pop stuff, if you go back even to the, the original Mac token, it hasn't been real snappy. So I, I wouldn't want to introduce a, a, a blocking dependency. Um, those are all just observations. I don't know what to do with it. Um, so uh, let's just move on for now. Uh, so the way forward right now, uh, we're going to discuss these issues and determine resolutions. We've already done a lot of that. We have a few more to kind of dig into a little bit deeper. The editors will work on that stuff, bring it back to the list where appropriate. Um, we'll you know, produce new drafts incorporating the decisions as needed. Uh, we're going to combine editors of the, of, the, um, of the two existing drafts into one and consolidate the decisions in the one draft. Um, as, uh, maybe also invite uh, Chuck to be an editor as he's sort of a, a, another uh, contributing individual that has, uh, has a lot of interest in this space. Um, that's it. Um, timelines. What? When are you planning to come up with uh, sort of like? When do we see the next version, or when do we see some emails about uh, the different issues that we just discussed and so on? Did you discuss that? No. no. Soon. I I don't have anything specific. This is high on my priority list, so I can give it time over the next few weeks with you. Similarly, yeah. So we're talking about I maybe a, it, a month or so. Yeah, you should certainly see actionable output with a month. We might just decide to do the things that we can do quickly and then do some more. Yeah, agree. OK, so I will guys ping you in a, in a month from now to see where we are. You shouldn't have to, but yeah, fair. Good. OK. Thank you, everybody. Okay, um, what was the next one? Uh, um, Phil, proof of sessions. Yeah, and then next is this one. So the architecture drafts had a working group last call. Um, Derek's doing or working on the Shepherd write-up, and he had a question, and it was about section 3.1, which is the use case of a resource server reusing the access token, and you want to stop that. Um, Derek's point out there's actually, I think, if I understand his question on the list, 
there are two use cases. One is the resource server acting in a nefarious way to, to reuse the resource token. And then there's an honest mistake uh, case, which is uh, using the token with, with an improper target or audience. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm not sure if he means confused deputy. The way I read it, it was simply that he's taking that token and using it on another server, which was not the audience for that token. Um, and so you're trying to block that mistaken poor use. And so you, you responded to his comment, then I think it's... Uh... So, yeah, I responded uh, to his comment. Um, and so there's some proposed text on the list. Because it was WGLC, I didn't make a lot of change. Um, but um, if you're thinking that's related to the confused deputy case, um, I would just suggest make comments on the list and we can yeah. follow up and decide if it needs more major work. Yeah. That would, um, Justin, that would be good if you could respond to that, if you have an opinion about this. Uh, and, and of course, others as well, because we would like to wrap up that sort of informational document. Yeah, sure. Um, I will I will say that I thought that the existing text uh, covered that adequately. So the fact that Derek's bringing this up as, like, doesn't this mean two different things? Does mean it's, it's going to be minor clarification, because I think that this is subsumptive of that. And um, I think he just wants it to be more precise. Mm -hmm. And we can Sorry. we can also add uh, a reference to the confused deputy uh, problem if it's relevant. Uh, okay, but uh, in general, um, that document is is further along. Past working group last called uh, the Shepherd write up only produced that sort of feedback, and I think that uh, is a good indication. It's like not uh, trashing it or so. So I think we are in pretty good shape with that one. Uh, that's the architecture document. As, as, as you can see on the screen. Uh, well, as clarification, I'm not sure that that was Derek's full write-up. That was just his an initial before I get into the whole thing. Oh, I wanted okay. to clarify that one point. Yeah, I will, I will double check with him uh, whether, whether that was his only sort of major comment or whether he has uh, not even started yet. Mike. Uh, we have a relatively simple working group draft. On Go to the box. We have a relatively simple working group draft on how to represent uh, proof of possession keys in JODs that went through working group last call in March. I got kind of busy with the RFC editors doing some other stuff, but uh, a little bit ago I did produce a new draft with the co-editors that addressed the working group last call comments. Uh, a number of you in the room did send in comments and it did result in normative changes. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so we separated the key versus um, encryption. I think that slide's wrong actually. We, we separated the case where the proof of possession key was encrypted versus when it was just represented as a JWK. No, that's correct, uh, using different subclaims. Um, we changed the title to indicate that this isn't how you do proof of possession. This is how you deliver the key with which you would do proof of possession, which is out of scope for this draft. Um, we updated language that formerly assumed possibly incorrectly in some uses that the issuer is an OAuth authorization server. Uh, based on some comments by Nat, we described some more ways that applications might choose to identify the presenter. Uh, we harmonized registry language, um, and we referenced some newly minted RFCs. So again, thanks for those who provided good feedback. Uh, I would request that John, Brian, Nat, and I think Hannes were the primary inputs to this draft. 
read the diffs, they're small. Let us know for sure whether we've adequately addressed the intent of your comments. And following that in Derek Shepard write up, I think we're good to go. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mike. This is Justin, just a very quick uh, procedural comment on that. Uh, would it be possible and or desirable to change the uh, the URL of the draft name because naming that particular document proof of possession may be very confusing when trying to pull all of the others, regardless of what the title is in the draft. So Mike, just like we didn't bother changing the name of SPOP, even though the title changed, you know, this is going to become RFC 8000 something. It really doesn't matter in the short term. Yeah, that's uh, um, on the on this key distribution. We had a meet. We had a meeting right before this one, and we tried to identify uh, the open issues with that document. And here's sort of the list that I would like to briefly walk you through in case you. Um, have some input. Um, so there's, as you know, like we have different types of OWASP clients and currently the document doesn't, uh, in the security considerations section, doesn't go into sort of describing the different implications of using uh, public clients versus confidential clients when using that uh, key distribution mechanism that is used with uh, the POP tokens. We also, um, for already for a fairly long time and still have this um, sort of question of, or we have two functionality, two, we support two types of credentials, symmetric and asymmetric as, as sort of being bound to, uh, to the token as Mike just explained with, uh, with the claims. And with the symmetric keys, it, it's always clear that uh, the key would be used with one specific server only, but then with, uh, the asymmet with asymmetric cryptography, there are two options. One is you can use it with multiple servers, the same, it's like in a, in a some sense, um, like a certificate, you can, you can use that uh, proof of possession access token with one server only or before so with multiple servers. And uh, there is some guidance needed, I believe, uh, on how uh, it would be used with multiple resource servers. Uh, which is which is currently not there. Um, yeah, and and actually related to that issue is of course uh, on how the client tells uh, the server with which of those servers it should use or it's allowed to use the access token. With currently, it's only so that's probably more a syntax issue. Uh, currently, the the value that the client provides is only in this. Uh, I think it's an audience parameter. It's only a single value. Uh, and of course, if it wants to use it with multiple different servers, uh, presumably that would be um, something of an array or whatever. But uh, not this hasn't been um, sort of looked into, and so that's why it's ended up on a on a the open issue list. Um, another another thing that we have uh, been wondering for for quite a while and still haven't figured out a response yet is this question of um, how or when to request the tokens and uh, what they would be specifically bound to. Uh, we, we of course said that they would be uh, for, the key would be related or bound to an access token, uh, but what happens if you want to request a new access token and have a ref and you use a refresh token, what would that refresh token be? Uh, a Bob token as well. Would that require a confidential client um, to be used or um, would that happen um, sort of like as to today it's um, in some sense you would al almost have to go through an entire exchange to request new access tokens that are bound to different keys. So there's some granularity that we have to sort of the, the granularity of the tokens that are being exchanged is still something that we have to work out. So if you have some, some comments uh, on those issues, I know that they are somewhat uh, deeper into the sort of technical realm, but it's, uh, we thought it's worthwhile to sort of brainstorm about the open issues and try to uh, put them on a slide deck so that you actually have something to, to look into and to figure out what uh, what would be 
what needs to be done for the next update. Okay, don't see anyone jumping to the microphone. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Nat. So, request by JWS for host to the bow, which is an awful name, and I'm going to come to that later, but next slide, please. So, um, for those of you who haven't read the draft, um, it's representing uh, RFC 6749 parameters, in, I mean, authorization request parameters into JWT, which can be potentially signed or encrypted, or signed and encrypted. And we talked a little bit about that uh, before. And it allows, the draft allows you to send that JWT as in the request parameter as a value, by, by value, or by reference through request URI parameter. And advantages are that requests may be signed or encrypted or it can be vetted because it's, it can be a static file vetted by you know, some policy authority or something like that before the fact. And also it can send larger requests by using, by reference when you're using some kind of extensions. Next please. So the status update, I have uploaded uh, all five which incorporates needs that were pointed out since IETF 92, especially thanks to Mike Jones, who provided a very good set of comments. And it's now aligned with op connect and I IANA auth parameter registry. But three questions remains. Next, please. One, can we just put all the parameters into JWT? Um, in fact, this mechanism is used in open ID connect but to be compliant to 6749, we had to, we couldn't you know, put everything in, uh, you know, some mandatory or required auth parameter had to be kept in the key value pair in the form um, authorization request. For example, response type, right? Can we just put them into this JWT and forget about you know, putting it into the request parameter? So that's one, that, that's my first question. So do we, anyone with views on that topic? This is Justin, yes. Uh, so when we implemented OpenID Connect, um, our implementation as kind of a side effect of how we had to process the parameters actually already does this. Um, so it will technically take in a non-compliant um, OpenID Connect slash OAuth message uh, because uh, Connect does have the language that the values inside the request jot um, have to match the ones that are in, and they basically they override effectively. Yeah. Um, so we hooked in, and I believe for all of the parameters, maybe actually not response type because of an upstream library bug, but uh, <laughs> everything else um, can sit inside that uh, request object in our implementation. So I would very much be in favor of this. I think it's a cleaner way to do it. Uh, John Bradley, I think the sensible thing to do is not duplicate parameters just because you can. Um, the only real question to my mind is, how do we modify 6749 so that this new spec isn't in violation of MUS? Um, Process-wise, I think um, it would uh, update that specification, I could imagine. Uh, it would be nice if we had a client that uses this new extension and talks to some other authorization server uh, that it doesn't break it. Some uh, like of course, well, since you uh, typically have registration, it's so break it, it anyways, kind of by design. Say again. It, if it, you have a bunch of your parameters that are in the signed request, 
you probably don't want some other authorization server that doesn't understand signed requests to actually process it. I don't know. I don't know that breaking backwards compatibility with someone who doesn't understand signed requests is actually that big a deal. So this is Justin again. I think that the uh, the reasonable thing here to do is to define this in terms of the inputs of 6749 such that required parameters become required claims inside the jot uh, and uh, effectively say that this, um, when this extension is in use and only when this extension is in use, then the input to the authorization endpoint is defined as uh, using this structure. So it's only going to be servers that are using this that actually understand that. All of the other OAuth servers are perfectly happy to keep taking inform parameters as well they should. Okay, um, let me ask the, um, the folks in the room what, uh, whether they agree with uh, John and, and Justin about this issue, issue that we should uh, basically update uh, the OAuth to RFC to allow the possibility to pass these parameters uh, within a JWT um, without duplicating them. Do you, if you agree that that's a good approach, then raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, seven, six, eight. Does it really have to update? No. That's a yeah. There are musts. I, I'm wondering what Justin's saying is under the context of implementing this profile, you can. Pro probably, yeah. Don't get hung up on the on the updating, yeah. but okay. but more about the, the the fact that it, the parameters are not duplicated. Kathleen Moriarty. So I'll catch it um, at least when it goes through my review and figure out what has to be done so that it can go all the way. Don't get hung up on it. Thanks. John Bradley, there, there are other errata that we are going to catch up on and perhaps at some point we can clean up this as part of that language. So I think we should move ahead with this and then sort out the alignment later. Yeah. Matt Miller, just noting that at least one hum from the room. Okay, so it, um, that was, a, uh, well, who's against uh, sort of the avoidance of duplication of parameters, just to make sure? <laughs> Yeah, that's, of course, uh, sounds a little weird, but uh, who wants to? Yeah. Who's in favor of duplication? Raise your hand yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nobody is, uh, uh, not, not surprisingly, but um, yeah. Okay. I think right. you got a message. Okay. Next, please. Uh, the second question is, so th th this one, that way. <laughs> So uh, corollary to both of these together, if, the, if we allow for duplicated parameters, we're saying we're not going to require duplicated parameters, but if we allow duplicated parameters, this still is relevant. Right. Okay. So uh, once there is a duplicated parameter, on which should take the precedence, the current draft says that it has uh, JWT takes precedence as it's going to be signed. So I, I think that's the only natural consequence. But yeah, but but would you want? Why would you want to have then duplicated parameters? Uh, this is Justin. So um, for runtime flexibility of a client who was handed the request object or the request object has been hosted by them. So in a similar way to uh, dynamic registration where you can have the signed request object as an input and also the free JSON parameters. Um, consequently, I say that we adopt a similar approach that it basically says the thing that's signed, um, if it's signed, then take that one over anything else that's passed in freehand. That's my suggestion here. If they differ, take, take the one that's in the signed. Um, that's I, I, I don't see why yeah. not. Yeah. The, John, again, the option 
um, that we don't have up there is just not letting you duplicate parameters. We didn't list that as an option because we hadn't made the previous decision. But if we allow them not to be there, one of the options is just say, if you're duplicating it, it's an error. So there's, other than perhaps some making it a little bit easier for some clients, there is really, I th there's probably an equal argument that it just adds to the confusion if you let people have different parameters in different places that mean the same thing. So it may be simpler just to say, don't duplicate it. Put it one place. Or <clears throat> so Mike Jones, um, in the Connect Working Group, as we were designing this mechanism for Connect, uh, some of the architects at Google, Breno and others, Naveen, basically said, look, we're going to have to duplicate them for now because the generic OAuth processing is going to barf if we don't have a response type, for instance. So we had to duplicate or had to allow duplication. But they also said, just don't make us compare them. Just throw away the ones that are duplicated. And so it's, it's very clear processing. If you make people check for error cases that shouldn't happen, then it's a burden, but it's not a burden to just take the ones in the signed request. Yeah. And we would break deployments that must have them duplicated right now if we said you can't duplicate it. William Dennis, just with an anecdote on, on recovering from duplication in the past, um, uh, the old spec, um, gives you two ways you can pass the baritone, well, it's three ways actually, but um, originally we were accepting two different ways, uh, so you could pass it as both a parameter and in the header, um, that worked, and I, I think we updated it at some point and just like picked one over the other, and it, just, just changing all these things causes a lot of problems because people might actually be passing like some erroneous value in one of them that, that you might have been, you know, you might have had second on your preference list and then you might just suddenly change that, so uh, I think it's just a mess in general having having these things duplicated, and I'm struggling to understand like why you would duplicate it but have it different. I think that's a really horrible case. Um, you go next. Yeah, so I actually, I actually, and my preference would be uh, probably um, to to actually hard error on on a on a duplication that's that doesn't match. Uh, just just because it helps flexibility in the future if you actually do want to um, kill one of them. I, I'm okay as going as far as hard errors on. Uh, duplication with different values are allowed, but your your colleagues Breno and Naveen would say, just don't make us do the check at runtime because it's silly. Okay. Okay. Um, we are running a little bit uh, out of time. I see. Um, we we are not going to discuss the the name uh, topic anymore. But on to wrap on wrap up on this one. Um, it seems there's, we would, uh, it seems the suggestion that Mike proposed at the end uh, is something worthwhile entertaining on a mailing list. Nat, maybe you can follow up on this and, and post a question to the list and see what uh, what people think. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and, and also post a mail about the, uh, come up with a new name. Yeah. So we have to speed up a little bit. Kipeng, you only have a few minutes to introduce us what the center constraint stuff is. Okay. So basically, uh, Mike just introduced the semantics, pop semantics uh, draft. And uh, so in the draft, it mentions about the key information method. So in the security, right? so the background is in the security architecture draft, it talks about uh, some security threats and what's the possible ways. Uh, so why it's a uh, center constraint and the other one is key information. So Cake information is mentioned in the pop semantic draft, but uh, the center constraint is not mentioned. So that's why we provide this draft. So next slide. So basically, we want to include the client uh, identifier in the uh, JWT payload. So that's the one proposal. And the other one. So uh, the client must be authenticated by the resource server. So basically, the presenter can issue a head or get request to, re to the RS, and then the RS return a response 
with a named header. And then in the next step, the client creates a JWS compact visualization over the nonce. And uh, in the step four, the client sends the request to the RS. This time with the authorization header with the name scheme and X token and the JWS. So next. So how to find the client key? So we have several methods. The first one is UI client ID. So the key can be found by the well-known uh, JWK UI. The second is uh, we can have pre-shared key tables. In a table, they can indicate the client ID and public key pair. So uh, the next method is the client metadata API. So from the client metadata API of the virtualization server, so it can be, the client metadata can be exposed. So next. So the question is, um, since it's relevant to the security architecture and the pop case semantics job, so should we match, match it into this uh, either of one of the draft or we proceed as a separate document or is it a better idea? So we want to get the group feedback. Good. Um, so uh, question, of who, who has read uh, or looked at that document or earlier version of it? Yeah, you, you're a co-author. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there will be an opportunity. There is uh, uh, Brian, Brian over there. Yeah, I, I think um, it would be nice if we get a few more folks to take a look at it and to find out whether that's a, a use case they want to uh, address. Um, so this is not Sakimura. Um, this draft was actually created in response to the working group last call of the uh, PopKey Semantics document. So I guess Mike has, has some kind of scan of the document before, but okay. Yeah, I'll volunteer to give it a review. Perfect, thank you. Eric, did you got that? So we get another review and then uh, I will I will send a, also a reminder to the list and maybe find someone else to do a review and then see whether uh, there are some cases that are not covered in through the uh, OP specifications that um, would make sense in this context. Thanks, it was a very clear presentation. Um, Sean. Okay, um, so we uh, presented this at the last IETF, um, but we still haven't received much traction from the working group or adopted it as a working group document. So there are um, a bunch of issues, um, I'll try and be quick, the, where the OAuth token endpoint or authorization endpoint can be used as redirectors for people who have registered clients. Um, so uh, the biggest problem is actually the browsers have changed the semantic of how they deal with fragment encoding. So uh, people can use that endpoint to leak information across our endpoint. Uh, so the, the issue here is not so much that there is a hole in OAuth though. In principle, you could use one token endpoint to perhaps, or authorization endpoint to attack another authorization endpoint or perhaps itself. But um, the biggest problem is that there are lots of enterprise APIs running around which perhaps haven't um, had enough, as much thought as about protecting themselves as, as we put in. Um, so we're, we looked at the situation. There's a bunch of places where you can leak information across and why don't we just skip towards the end. Uh, essentially, to, to which end? Hmm? Uh, this end? Yeah. Um, so the mitigations that we've come up with and um, looking for more feedback from people. Um, so one of the ways that things leak is through the refer. This isn't new to, to most implementers, um, but apparently many implementations don't do anything to clear the refer. Um, across the endpoint. Um, so there's 
one doing their possible mitigations are doing an internal redirect or there are uh, content tags that you can put in your redirect which set the referrer going out so that you're not leaking that information so so for performance reasons a lot of people will um, use the content security tags um, which work in some browsers not all browsers so it isn't a perfect solution but um, has much better performance than doing an extra redirect Brian's mumbling it's getting better you want to get up to the microphone and say that it's getting better? First request is that you speak into the mic. Um, I am speaking into the mic. The only comment about the content security headers is, is support for them is rapidly improving in browsers. So it's, 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 it's good. So in general, I don't think it's all that controversial that not leaking stuff in the referrer is preferable to leaking stuff in the referrer. We need to get that message out to the developers. Hmm. Um, we also need to um, get the message out that fragment encoding um, also leaks because browsers now helpfully reappend the previous fragment to the new redirect. Um, so uh, the way to deal with that is to append an empty fragment to the to your to the redirects that you're sending out so that you're not helpfully copying the fragment from the previous call. Um, there's also some some other um, you know by allowing the redirect without um, you know in the in the error case without in OAuth without presenting any kind of prompt to the user um, we are potentially allowing for you know confused FUD sorts of attacks where where users think that they especially where the referrer coming from one party is used as you know many people engage in bad practices and sometimes looking at where referrers are informs people's security decisions so a referrer coming from yahoo at some arriving at some site may actually have a different context presented to the user etc so there are attacks that are potentially used by people um, in in that and if you can register a client you know i think google just uh, returns 400 errors rather than um, allowing certain kinds of errors mm -hmm. Um, the question is, do we want to move this into the work group, actually get people to, to comment on it and try and provide some sort of formal best practices to the, the developers or ignoring it and hopefully it will go away. But uh, yeah, the reason why I like that, uh, that type of work was simply because there's some real world problems like with SPOP or the, the artist formerly known as SPOP. Um, <laughs> And Antonio, who, who uh, approached us, is a sort of a re security researcher who has looked at many of those web attacks and has uh, gotten sort of bounty awards for those. And so he approached us and, and brought that to our attention. And I think that was very good from a sort of community interactions, uh, sort of non sort of classical standardization participants who uh, reach out to us and, and inform us about problems. And it's somewhat similar to what uh, we have been trying to do earlier to just make people aware of some of the problems and some of the assumptions that we had made initially during the OAuth design turn out to be not necessarily true anymore. So I think um, it, it's good to document those. So, so it isn't so much that we have a problem with the OAuth protocol. We have perhaps incomplete security considerations for implementers. Yeah. And when we wrote this, I was thinking that you would have to be a complete idiot not to clear referrers that's best practices for doing web development. But apparently other people had different things yeah, in, in mind. So, so this is not second like normal research. Um, I think this is a very important work. It has to be adapted by the working group. The question is whether we want to have it as an independent work or as a rata to the main spec. I, I think this is important enough to be, you know, in, yeah, in, 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 I mean, separate work or to be en, you know, enrolled into the 6749 so that people will know updates, mm -hmm. yeah. Could be both, I guess. 
uh, Wendy Seltzer, I wanted to uh, draw the group's attention to work on referrer policy being done in uh, the W3C Web Application Security Working Group, um, where uh, that uh, work to let uh, web authors set a referrer policy could be useful in the best so practices. We, we recommend that in, in our draft as both as the content tag and as the header. So we do point that out. It just isn't covered by all browsers at the moment. So I think clearly everyone should do that. But there may be other mitigations that people want if depending upon their browser population. And uh, so on the flip side, if there are uh, additional uh, issues with referrers that you're seeing, uh, please uh, come and feed those into the uh, web app sec draft comments. Right. The, the biggest pushback that I, I think I've seen on the recommendations we've made is that people really hate appending an empty fragment. Um, that we get pushed back, that their users are confused, et cetera. I know Facebook puts in a fragment and an underscore equals underscore for reasons which are probably entirely historical, but many people copy that. Um, for, you know, it's good enough for them, must have some security juju. We need to, I think we're helping some, help some, some, di some more dialogue with the W3C about, well, for we've made some assumptions about how fragment encoding happens across browsers. We used it ourselves for getting tokens into JavaScript. Perhaps some of our assumptions weren't necessarily ideal. We don't want to wind up being an open redirector for fragments. What's the best way for us to deal with this? So I'm sure that we're not the only people in the world who have noticed that browsers have changed their behavior. Mm. And they've changed their behavior for good web reasons. We're not we're not saying that, that that's wrong. We're just saying how do we deal with this when we potentially had you know four years ago different assumptions. In any case, with uh, this work, also with uh, the work that Kepeng proposed and and others, we'll have to uh, talk with Kathleen uh, in the upcoming months about um, how to change the charter and the milestones to accommodate for the, for these type of new items. And uh, uh, Derek and I will, will trigger that conversation. And so we'll, we'll work on it. And there are a couple of other items. So we'll obviously post that to the list, discuss this and so on. But just, um, I think it's good to be aware of these type of things. Thanks, John. Um, I know we are uh, a little bit out of time, but um, in, in case you still have a few minutes, uh, there's some new stuff that, uh, William wants to inform you about, he actually submitted a document uh, today that was floating around earlier already, but this time it's actually sent to the OWAS working group about native applications, which uh, uh, relates a little bit to that topic, yeah. that is earlier topic we just discussed. Right, so William Dennis here to talk about native applications. Um, and since the draft was only submitted this morning uh, or this afternoon, I'll just try and convince you as to why I think this is worth us uh, thinking about. Uh, so just quickly, uh, OAuth 2 basically in, in 2010, it didn't really even mention, the, the original draft didn't really even mention native apps, um, which I guess is not a big surprise as the whole kind of mobile first phenomenon hadn't, hadn't really taken, uh, taken root. The final spec did include a section that mentioned it and it talked about two possible ways. Uh, that you could use native apps with OAuth, and that is the external user agent and the embedded user agent. And it seems that most people actually went the embedded user agent path, uh, mostly because it's easier. Um, but when it comes to single sign-on, I, I think really the objective is that we actually want people to sign on once, not simply sign on with the same credential everywhere. Um, next slide, please. So when you use an embedded user agent, this is really what happens. Um, the authorization server logs the user in and, and, and sitting there on the device is, inside that app is now a fully scoped like session token that, that is the most powerful token. Then uh, a scoped down OAuth token is issued from that. So the app is actually at this point really in possession of both. Um, and we kind of just ask them, hey, if you don't mind, throw away that really powerful token and just use the OAuth one that we gave you that was meant for you. Um, I mean, does anyone think that's actually a good way to do this? Show hands if you do. All right, good. 
So next slide, please. So, so I hope I've convinced you that embedded user agents are really bad. Um, external user agents are, are the solution to that. And with that in mind, um, this best practice proposal is, is covers the reasons why we should only use external user agents and details how we can do that, uh, both as the native app client and as the authorization server. Great. Uh, please take a look and uh, let me know what you think. Thank you. Thank, thank you, William. Um, yeah, Tom, it's, go ahead. Tony Nadlin, I don't, you know, your last slide is pretty nebulous, right? Good, good and bad. Um, there are lots of reasons why you want embedded um, agents, right? I think I disagree with all of them, um, but. No, you can use the operating system as part of, as part of your trust relationship. So you that's don't. Next step, no, that's an internal, that's an internal. Yes, that's. In, in this document, it's considered an expert. <laughs> oh, I see. We're back to the on behalf of and no, I, and I, act as. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think this is fairly clear, actually. Even in the OAuth two specification, it, it basically says that an embedded user agent is one where where the host app kind of has like full control. They can like inspect it, they can manipulate it. That's actually the definition inside OAuth two. So I'll just use those definitions. Um, so strictly using that definition, I think embedded user agents are just plain wrong. Um, yeah. oh, okay. But so so great. external means operating system provided. Yeah. Is what we're going for. And your input to the draft would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Not sure there's any need for a draft if the operating systems are doing this already. Well, so what we've seen in the wild is. Um, Pardon? What we've seen in the wild is that a lot of people implement an OAuth authorization flow using a web view. And, and that web view is an embedded user agent. Um, so if, if you log into your Google account, for example, the the app can can take that entire login no, token no. And, and just well they can even take the password, I should say too. They can they can get everything and do whatever they want to do. Yeah. It's just on their good graces that you hope that they only took that OAuth part that you really wanted to get. Yeah. I agree with, definitely agree with that. That's why we've done it within our operating system. Right, so. and that's what he is essentially saying. Maybe the terminology you guys are using is, uh, you both are using is misaligned, but uh, I think you both say the same thing and you do the same stuff. Uh, but I think we, we need to discuss this because there are two aspects. First of all, there's the security aspect that we uh, so provide additional guidance on, and then as a side effect, we would actually get this SSO uh, feature across applications, which yeah. would be really powerful. Um, which which we have, of course, for on on sort of with the non-native apps, if you will, on web browser apps, uh, which which comes there quite handy. But uh, as we transition to the native apps, we sort of lost that feature right. just be, because of the way how these things work. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I see a world where if you're prompted for your password, it should be either you have a new device or someone's actually trying to fish you. I can't really see too many other reasons that you should be entering your password like again and again and again. Um, so yes, th th this one of the key objectives is to take us to that um, SSO utopia. Yeah, and also, um, this is Justin. I just wanted to say that an interesting but important confounding factor here is Apple's recent uh, stance on rejecting everything that uses an external system browser to do flows like this from the App Store. So the, the good news on that front is with iOS 9, Apple actually does have a blessed um, way to use a, an external user agent in the form of... I, okay, so I thought that that blessed thing was still an embedded user agent, but it looked different or something. So, so I guess to the, to the original question, it, it, it blows the lines a little. I think from a security okay. point of view, we would consider it external. Okay, so it is externalized from the app. See, I didn't, I did not right. know that. Okay, um, then it runs I'm in a good. separate process. And I think, uh, I, I do appreciate the original feedback. We should maybe define this a little bit better. I think that the key definition is that it has to be a separate security context, generally like a process or something, which, yeah. which iOS has delivered. Um, and actually Android has the similar thing now too, so. Yeah. Um, but it, but it, uh, it highlights a more important aspect in, in the IDF work where we sort of uh, blur the boundary a little bit between um, sort of the purely standards work that is supposed to be implementation independent and then specific env deployment environment where some of the, the, the problems of the deployment and the security models in the operating system sort of shine through. And that's, uh, I think, quite exciting. Yeah, that, that is definitely a... Uh an issue for this spec, actually. I, I, but I think the good news is that a lot of the patterns are repeated everywhere. So 
um, at least the way the draft is presented, um, the entire kind of body of the draft is using fairly standard patterns, and it's only in the appendix where I've broken down into like iOS specific, Android specific, and hopefully soon Microsoft specific. Um, we'll try and hopefully try and keep it that way, um, keep the best practice and the actual implementation a little bit separate. Um, yeah, please take a look at the document, new document. Um, if someone volunteers, uh, is anyone who volunteers to take a look at that? Oh, a couple of Tony. Tony, Brian, Eric, John, Nat, and what's your name? Eduardo. Uh, say again? Eduardo. Eduardo. Okay, cool. That's thank you. Thank you guys. Um, and sorry for running over time. I was, I was just gonna support, support the draft, but I think okay. it has support. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you go back. No, yeah, we, we put those in. I don't, I don't think it's in those.